Okay, let's, uh, we're ready to start the um, second uh, session. So um, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Anka Dragon. Um, Anka is a faculty member in electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley, uh, where she's been for a few years now. Uh, she works in the important area of human machine uh, interaction and interface. Uh, this is perhaps the most complex modeling problem sort of in the whole uh, autonomy um, uh, endeavor. Um, she already has many uh, recognitions and awards. I'll just mention two of them. Uh, she has the NSF uh, P case and also the ONR YIP. So uh, Anka, please. Thank Welcome. you. Thanks for the invitation. So I wanted to talk today about a slightly different take on safety and uh, verification, which is the safety and verification of reward functions. Um, and let me give you an example of how I got very interested in this. Um, essentially, the long story short is by the reward function that I designed failing over and over again. So here's an example from autonomous cars. When I got to Berkeley, I got interested in autonomous cars. Um, and the first thing I noticed is that cars tend to be very conservative. Uh, if this orange car is uh, the autonomous one here and needs to go into the left lane, I tell it to maximize efficiency, also be safe, avoid collisions, stay on the road, etc. It turns out the car won't do very well. Um, it will predict that the human in the white car plans on keeping on going forward. It will have to slow down and then merge behind them in order to avoid collisions. Um, unless there's someone else coming, in which case it will wait for them to go. And then the next person comes, it waits for them to go and so on and so forth. And then it kind of misses its turn. Um, so, or it gets stuck. And this is, um, not what humans do. What humans do in the same situation is at some point we are done waiting and we just kind of nudge ourselves in there and, and rely on the car behind to decelerate a little and make room. And so we worked hard. Um, this is somewhere that Dorsa did back when I started at Berkeley to give cars and robots more generally an understanding of this influence that they have on humans so that they can elicit the, these, these reactions from people and sort of make progress. And so we said, okay, you can influence people. Um, but then we found out that the car has no problem trying to cut you off and make you decelerate at seven meters per second square and uh, in order to make progress. So that's what's optimal according to its reward function. And so this exposed to me that, oh wait, we can't just optimize for our car's efficiency. We also have to optimize for not being jerks to other people for their efficiency. So we added this courtesy term into the cost function um, and so far, so good. It solves some things on merges, uh, multi-lane roads. But at an intersection, the car didn't just wait for you. It decided to back up because that would incentivize you to go through faster in through the intersection, which is great for its courtesy term in its objective. Now, remarkably, this actually worked okay with users, no problems there. Um, but uh, you know, here's the thing: if there's someone in the back or if the car has a passenger, now that person is freaking out, wondering why the heck their car is inching backwards from the intersection. Um, so the cost, the reward function was still missing aspects that I cared about, right? That I didn't yet express, like comfort of the passenger or legibility of the car's intentions to other drivers. And sort of the list goes on and on. Um, so we're getting good at task specific, uh, uh, basically mapping task specifications. And I use rewards, but you can use constraints, for instance, and, and turning them into behavior by optimizing, um, by satisfying, by doing reinforcement learning, whatever your method of choice is. But what we often sort of sweep under the rug is just how hard it is to write down that task specification itself, right? How do you capture comfort for an autonomous car? How do you trade off between safety and efficiency and not crossing double yellow lines and all these things that are important? And we sometimes think constraints will save us, but they're just as bad because what threshold do you set on the probability of a collision? What happens when you can't both meet that safety threshold and not cross the double yellow line and so on? Um, that, that was, I have more examples from my own work, but I want to give this example from OpenAI of rewards gone wrong. Um, so here is an example from a boat racing game. So this is a game where they train the deep RL policy. 
Um, and the goal is to right win in the game. And I, as you're seeing this white boat here, that's our agent is not doing very well at the racing and at the winning. Um, it's just doing this loop. And you might think that there's something broken with the with the policy. Basically, the optimization has gone wrong, but it turns out it hasn't. Um, so what this boat has figured out to do is to do this little loop here and time it just right such that it hits those um, those green turbo thingies, um, and each of them gives it a thousand points or so every time every time it hits them. So it's just collecting a lot of points this way. And uh, the reward that it was given was score in the game. And so as the, the cleverness of this is that it's a much, much, much better way to optimize for score in the game uh, than to actually, you know, bother racing and trying to win and, and so on. So, and it's not what we had in mind. Um, so overall, I think the problem stems from the fact that we in AI and robotics, we tend to kind of lie a little bit to ourselves. We pretend like the problem is as follows. You have an agent, there's a state space, uh, the, agents, the, uh, the agent takes actions um, that affect the state, and there's some reward function that falls from the sky miraculously, and the problem definition is really just finding a policy that optimizes that reward function cumulatively in expert. And we do this because it's a way to make progress on a concrete problem, but ultimately that's not what the real problem is. The real problem is that there's an agent, there's states, there's actions, yes, sure, but then there's a human who wants something, and the agent's job is to do what the human wants. The reward function is implicitly in the person's head, and that's what the, the, the uh, agent has to optimize. So I don't think that AI is about optimizing a specified reward, I think, and doing that well and doing that robustly. I mean, it, it's also about that, but I think it's actually more, it's about optimizing safely and robustly an intended reward. Um, and that's what we should build robots to do. So what does it mean to optimize intended reward? Well, let's make this a little bit more concrete. Uh, we're going to represent reward functions in some parametric space, could be linear combinations of features, could be a deep neural network with state and action as input. Um, um, and we're gonna call the weights, the uh, the parameters theta in this talk. And what's hard is that the robot does not observe theta. Instead, it has to have some uncertainty over what the right theta is. So what defines the reward function when the person actually wants and try to estimate that somehow. And if you think about what we do now as a standard process from this lens, it goes something like this. The human gives the robot their best guess at theta. And then the robot just pretends like we're gonna call that theta tilde. The, and it's not exactly theta because we're humans and we're fallible and we don't say exactly what we want, but the robot nonetheless pretends like we're, you know, we're this magical, perfect information sensor um, and says, oh, well, this is the simplest estimation problem. I just put all the probability mass on the theta you specified, you've identified theta for me. Um, and that's just not the case. And to make matters worse, once we've given the robot the theta tilde, it will optimize that theta tilde through thick or thin. So let me give you an example of what I mean. So let's say I deploy the robot and um, um, here the robot is uh, programmed to trade off efficiency with maximizing distances from obstacles in order to maximize safety. Uh, obstacles like the table here. And imagine that this is in my home and it's helping me unload the dishwasher um, as I've been doing a lot of during the pandemic. Um, now, as I see it move, Right, it's moving this cup, and I get worried because I feel like if it it's keeping it very high up from the ground, if it drops it, right, it might fail. Uh, it might it might break this cup. And so, what I might do as an end user here, let's pretend, is I might actually just intervene and physically correct the robot. But now the question is. What does the robot do the moment I let go? Does the robot keep the cup closer to the ground? No, the robot does whatever is optimal according to that theta tilde that was specified that said maximize distance from things like the table. And so the robot says, oh my God, I'm so glad that you let me go because now I can go back to doing the task in the optimal way. So I think while optimizing specified rewards sort of makes a lot of sense. If you look at it from this lens of needing to optimize intended reward, we can see that agents tend to learn um, a little too much 
from what we specified because they treat it as the ground truth and too little from everything else, like these corrections that people are willing to provide, like I was doing in the previous video. So we're focusing on one source of information, the specified reward, and we're leaving a lot of potential information on the table. Um, and it turns out that we leave a lot more than we might think. So people might physically interact with the robot um, like I was doing. We might say stuff in natural language. Um, imagine the robot is about to go through some puddle of water and you switch it off in a panic to protect it. That signal, that's information that you're giving it about how it wasn't doing a good job. Um, and um, um, maybe my favorite one, my favorite example of information that's there is actually in the environment itself. So let me explain this. Uh, imagine someone asks you to clean up a room and as you enter the room, you see this beautifully laid out house of cards. I bet that even though the person didn't specifically say, oh, but don't clean up the house of cards, every one of you would leave the house of cards there because clearly the person cares about it, right? You didn't specify this, but it's implicit in the environment um, and that you don't want it destroyed. So I think humans, through what we do, through what we say, even through how we set up our environment, I like to say that we leak information about what we want and therefore about what the robot should optimize for. And this information can help fill in the blanks of what we forget to specify ahead of time. Um, and the question is how do we enable robots to extract that this information people are leaking left and right? You know, How do we get them to stop over relying on specified rewards and, and relying more on these other sources? In other words, how do we go from observing the feedback to an actual belief update on these parameters theta that the robot doesn't know? Um, and to do this, what's hard here is that we, we need what we might call a human model or an observation model. Um, given the reward function, what feedback, what, what sort of behavior from the human do you expect? And we need a model that works well, not just for one single one of these feedback types, but for everything that's listed on the slide, the house of cards included, right? So now that we're on the same page about kind of the setup, we have uncertainty about the reward function. We use human feedback of various sources to learn about the reward. Um, what I want to do for us through our time together is first talk about how we might do this for the special case of a specified reward. And then towards the answer of if we have time, pop back up and show you how we generalize this to all these other types, including the house of cards. Um, so, okay. So when you specify a reward for your robot, what does it mean for the robot, um, for the reward that you specify to be merely evidence in a Bayesian sense about the reward you actually want the robot to optimize? Like why, why do you not end up with the right theta to begin with? What's the difference between the theta that you want and this proxy, this theta tilde, you end up specifying. Um, and it's not like you just take your through theta and then, and then you know, add some Gaussian noise and that's it, right? There must be some process that makes you sort of fail at specifying the thing that you actually want the robot to do. If you could specify what you want the robot to do, you just do that. So we thought about this for a while. We realized that what's going wrong is that you can't possibly look at all possible environments that the robot might be placed in ever and make sure that the reward you specify works everywhere. So what drives the suboptimality or the difference between theta um, and theta tilde is that you only look at some development or training set of environments when you tune your reward function for the robot. And you decide on theta tilde based on those development environments, but they're not everything that the robot might see at deployment time. So usually what goes wrong is you get surprised by behavior, when you get surprised by some behavior, there's some fundamental difference between what you might call the development and the deployment environment. So um, um, basically, if you kind of come back to this little boat example, remember the boat spinning uh, because it's optimizing points. Well, what was happening there is that at deployment time, it had these options. It could race and win, and it would get some points, say 20,000, or it could do this loop thing behavior and then get even more points, but lose, say 50,000 points. 
And it chose to do the latter. Now, why did it choose to do the latter? Is because the programmer specified score in the game as the reward function, as the theta tilde. Um, and then the question is, why did the, 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 the why did the programmer do that? Well, clearly they were looking at some development set of environments for which this score in the game was actually incentivizing the correct behavior, right? That that where if you didn't if you didn't win in these development sets you would probably not get that good of a score. In other words, score and winning were correlated at development time, but that no longer was true at deployment time. And that's what gets you. It's one of the many things that can get you is where you're relying on something based on your development set, you write a reward function that works well there, but then at deployment time, something different happens and that reward function no longer generalizes. Um, so the key idea here is that we have to account for this, right? That the specified reward is not the same as the true reward. And we should not expect that the behavior it induces everywhere is the right behavior. However, we do know for sure where it does induce good behavior. It induces good behavior on the environments that the designer actually used during development time to tune the reward function. So whatever designer landed on as the specified reward, the behavior it incentivizes on those development environments, not everywhere, just the development environments is good behavior, meaning it has high true reward. Um, in other words, what you specify comes in a context and in the context is here, the development set and you should, the robot shouldn't interpret it literally, it should interpret it in, in this context. And so mathematically, the probability of me writing down a theta tilde doesn't just depend on uh, theta star, it also depends on the development environments that I'm looking at. And so the way we've turned this insight into math is by saying that if you look at what behavior theta tilde incentivizes in this development set, um, the lower, the, the, the higher the reward of that behavior with respect to theta star, the more likely I am to write down that theta tilde as my, my reward function. Um, so if we plot here, so what does this do? If we plot here the space of all trajectories, and I flip the sign here so that lower is better because I like costs. Um, uh, it, let's say that this is the, the theta star, right? This is uh, when you evaluate these trajectories respect to theta star, this is what you do. And this would be the optimum here. Now, what this model says is that this is, if this is my theta star, what, what reward function theta tilde might I specify for the robot? And this model says, probably not this one. This other reward function does not produce behavior that's good with respect to theta star. So I will probably not specify that one. Um, I'll look at my development environment and say, no, nope, that's not the right, that, that I have to fix something. But the idea is that there might be a lot of possible reward functions that in a sense agree on the development environment with theta star. They produce the same behavior that theta star would want. And this model is accounting for the fact that as programmers of these systems, we might not be able to disambiguate that on the development set, then we might specify any of those. And then the challenge is that on the deployment environment, what might happen is that this correlation that they have now breaks. They evaluate trajectories differently. And if I specified, you know, this one instead of that one, they have different optima and now I run into trouble. And so that's the model. You basically, the behavior incentivized by the specified cost and development has low true cost. Um, and what um, the way you use this is you just do a Bayesian belief update. Um, and so you just think of it as evidence about the reward and you recover this posterior. Um, and now the world is your oyster. You could do things like planning an expectation with respect to this posterior. So accounting for that uncertainty you have over what the true reward is. You could do risk averse planning. Um, to give you one example, this is uh, my student Ellis um, um, being around our robot arm, Jayco. And uh, what's hard about the robot moving when Alice is around is that there's these different aspects of the task that are important. You want to avoid collisions. You want to stay far enough away from fragile objects. You want to maintain a comfortable distance from Alice. Uh, and all of these aspects sort of come at attention with each other. Now, as designers, we kind of implicitly know what the trade off should be. And so what we do is we look at some development environments and we tune until the robot does the right behavior in all of them. And Ellis did that. And then 
at some point we were happy. We said we have a good reward function. The robot is behaving correctly in all of the environments that we thought about. And then later on, inevitably, we hit a new environment where the robot just decides to plow through the vase. Now, this is one thing that I could have fixed through hard constraints, I agree, but that's not the point here. The point is that it's really hard for all of these things to, to be resolved in some cases. And so instead of just relying on what we specified, what we're saying the robot should do is treat it as evidence using that human model that we've been talking about, recover a posterior, and then use that posterior for planning. And even when the robot is planning an expectation, it's just hedging its bets now against all, the, all these different possible reward functions that we could have met. So that's really neat because you're making the robot sort of more conservative, but, but sort of in a conscious way, right? Like it, it's going to trust some things about what you said, but not trust things that you couldn't have dis disambiguated on the development side. Okay, now the last thing I want to say about this part is that when we move to something like autonomous driving, hedging your bets against every possible reward function that's still high probability under your posterior is really too conservative. And so what we found there is that, yes, I can specify a theta tilde, the robot can run this posterior, but the robot doesn't do a great job when it plans an expectation, let alone risk averse with respect to this posterior. So what we figured out we can do is to help the robot out is enable the robot to take this posterior and now go back to the person and make queries. So basically come up with an environment that it thinks probably it will get a lot of information out of by exposing that environment to the person. Intuitively, so these are environments that have high expected info gain. Intuitively, these are environments where the different reward functions in the posterior are fighting with each other. They disagree on what the right behavior is. So they're very unlike the development set where they all all agreeing with each other. And indeed, what we see is that the regret, which we measure through violations that are happening in this um, in this world, uh, the regret is actually much higher for these, these environments that the robot proposes to you, meaning they're actually good and informative and you should look at them because they're actually breaking the reward function that you specified. So it's like a debugging helper tool. We call this actually assisted reward design because the robot is helping you by exposing you to environments that are actually um, probably um, failing according to what you specified already. And so by exposing designer to these edge cases, the regret on a held out environments goes down quickly, um, much more so when you're doing active, uh, when you're doing this actively. Okay, so that was sort of the, the bit that I wanted to mainly talk about today, which is how the reward function that you specify is merely just evidence about what you want because you as a developer, are, you're fail fallible too, you're not a perfect oracle and the robot shouldn't treat you as such. Um, now, we have all these other feedback types. How do we generalize to these other feedback types? And let me, I have like, what, three minutes, Claire? Uh, I think you have about a few more than that, right, Gare? Uh, more like six minutes. Perfect. Okay. So now that we're, that we've discussed. Seven to be precise. Okay, great. Um, that we discussed this particular case of a reward function as being feedback, as being evidence about what the person wants. Let's talk about generalizing that to all these other types of feedback sources of information that I shared at the beginning of the talk. And to do that, I want to point out that there's two more sources of information that are not on this slide that have been very well studied and we know how to interpret them very well. One of them is comparisons. So when the person looks at two trajectories and says, this one, psi A, is better than psi B, we know very well how to interpret that comparison as evidence about the reward function. So we have a model for that. And it goes something like this. We say, we say the person has these two choices, psi A and psi B. And we think they choose based on the cumulative reward of these two choices. 
And we think they're a little bit noisy. So they're going to choose psi A with probability proportional to the exponent of the cumulative reward of psi A. And what I want you to notice is that the normalizer here is over the two choices that they could have made, right? So that's learning from comparisons. The other thing we know how to do is learning from demonstrations. And that's a particular version I'm going to talk about is Bayesian inverse reinforcement learning here. Bayesian reinforcement learning here, if, uh, Bayesian re inverse reinforcement learning is also thinking of the person as having choices, now, but now the choices are implicit. So the thought is, or one way to interpret Bayesian IRL is to say the person has, can demonstrate any trajectory, but they choose one. How do they choose the one trajectory that they demonstrated? By picking the trajectory out of the space of all trajectory that has the highest reward. And again, this is approximate. We account for the person being somewhat noisy. So the probability of them picking something is proportional to exponent of the cumulative reward. And so both comparisons and demonstrations are choices, explicit or implicit, that the person is making with respect to the reward function. I call this reward rational choices noisily. Now, if you look at the model that we used for rewards as feedback for a theta tilde, well, that also looks suspiciously similar to that. It was the probability of a theta tilde is proportional to the exponent of, but it wasn't really the reward of theta tilde because theta tilde is not a reward function. It's not a trajectory, right? It's a reward function. So we grounded it in possible trajectories. So we think here the choices, it's still the person is making a choice, but the choices are not trajectories. They're possible rewards they could specify. And so when they choose theta tilde, they're implicitly not choosing to specify all the other things that they could have specified. The only problem is that they're, they, we can't really say that they're choosing based on the reward of theta tilde, because theta tilde is a reward function itself, not a trajectory. And so instead, we're thinking of grounding these choices into trajectories by looking at the, the expected reward that trajectories that optimize theta tilde are inducing and comparing that with the reward that other possible theta bars would be inducing. And that here, that choice then leads to the same sort of model on the bottom. And so all of these are reward rational, sometimes implicit choices that people make. Sometimes the choices are over trajectory. Sometimes they're about something else. So when it comes to thinking about how we should extract this leaked information from all these other sources of information, I sort of claim a good starting point is to take any source of information and think of them as the person making a choice with respect to the reward function. And so when the person is pushing on the robot like I was doing, then the choice I'm making is with respect to an external torque that I'm applying. And that induces a trajectory. Um, we think of it as a deformed trajectory for the robot. And I'm picking a deformed trajectory that's better than other ones. Um, so here I push on the robot and the robot does this belief update by interpreting my torque as a choice and now actually keeps the cup closer to the table because it's realizing that that better explains um, this choice that I made. When it comes to the person switching you off, we also think of the person as making a choice implicitly. They could have done nothing, but they didn't. They chose to actually switch the robot off. And so that means that the reward of the trajectory that resulted from this, which is that the robot is now stopped and will stay stopped for the time horizon, is better than the reward of the trajectory that corresponds to doing nothing, which would have let the robot continue. And so again, you can think of that as an implicit choice. Now, what about the house of cards? This is a little more, more out there. So, so far we've looked at sources of information that actually look at human behavior. The person had to do something. So imagine that you're in a room that has some fragile vase in the middle. You would have had to figure out that you shouldn't break the vase as you move through the room. You would have literally had to see the person avoid the vase, move around it. And then you would have thought, oh, okay, this, this, this is a choice that they're making. It, the only thing that makes sense here is that they don't want to run into the vase. Um, however, Imagine you didn't see any of this. You walk into the room and the vase is there and it's not the beginning of the universe, which means that the person has been acting in this room already prior to the robot observing it. And the vase is there 
And that should give you information already that the person doesn't want the vase broken because if they wanted it broken, they would have broken it. Um, and so when the agent is deployed in an environment that the human has been acting in, that state of the environment itself has information about the human's intended reward because the human has been acting in that environment even though the robot didn't get a chance to observe that. And yes, we think of that state as a choice that the person is implicitly making out of the state the, out of the uh, space of all possible states and we think of it as basically being grounded into trajectories that are all trajectories that end at that state so when you go from the beginning of time negative t all the way to zero you have to decide on negative t here um they the all the all the trajectories that end in that state are consistent with this and you're choosing that over trajectories that don't end in that state um, and so basically the, the, to think about this, the robot is really saying, well, what reward function is consistent with the state that I'm seeing? Uh, if the person wanted to break the base, they would have gone through and I would have seen a broken base. That's not what I'm seeing. If the person didn't care, they would have been efficient and gone through and broken the base. That's not what I'm seeing. It must be that the person actually cares about not breaking the base. That's the thing that's consistent with what I'm seeing. And so in sort of this scenario, when you tell the robot go to the purple door, it looks at the fact that the vase is still there and actually goes around this. Um, the cuter thing is that you get desirable side effects as well out of that. So in this little environment here that Rohan set up, we have a train that's moving around and this um, train can run out of batteries. And then the robot enters the room, it sees that the train is still running, figures out that probably the person cares about the train running. So it goes, it picks up batteries for this train, puts batteries in and then goes to the purple door, which I think is adorable. Okay, so I think that it's not about specified rewards because specified rewards are wrong. I think we have to deal with this much harder problem of optimizing intended rewards. Luckily, there's a plethora of information about these intended rewards. And I think we can start interpreting this information as choices that people are making implicitly with respect to the reward function that they actually want. And that's a framework for sort of unifying, bringing all of this information in. And at the moment you observe more and more and more about the person, you can update your understanding of what they want through the robot's lifetime. So I think we can learn, we overlearn from specified rewards, but leave information on the table. Hopefully we can read the right amount of information into each source if we interpret these sources as reward rational implicit choices. Um, and of course, the thing that I'm doing these days a lot of is questioning the rational part of this and trying to, trying to address that. But um, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening and thanks to my students and, and collaborators on this work. Uh, thank you, Anka. Um, so we have time for one or two quick questions. Uh, I see one, uh, Phil uh, Crane, Crane uh, Phil, go ahead and unmute. Hi, hi Gear. Thanks. Um, so what you're what you're saying seems to imply that you need the best possible information about the reward and, and implicit requirements function, which sort of implies an expert system kind of a thing, especially when we think about autonomy and driving. Um, can you comment a little bit more on that? I think we're, if I understand your question correctly, I'm in a sense trying to say the opposite, which is every, every attempt we'll make at specifying exactly what this thing is doing will fail. And therefore the system has to be interpreting it statistically, like has to interpret it as evidence and figure out and sort of help, help us fill in the blanks. Um, so I think it's almost like the opposite of going towards an expert system is, is, is building AI tools that help the person, um, that, that don't put the person, let me put it this way, let's not put the person, the, the burden on the user to specify the objective function and us in controls, all we deal with is how to optimize that objective function. I think it's on us as well to give people tools to write down what they actually want. And this is kind of going a step in that direction. Mm -hmm. Is there one more quick question? Okay, well, thank you, Anka. Thank you.